everybody. Can I get everyone to take their seats? Um, we have, as you can tell, an incredibly busy agenda, and we're already two minutes behind. So uh, we will probably be as close to the agenda as we get all day. But I want to thank everybody uh, who came today. Uh, I want to thank everybody who's helped organize this. Um, some of you have uh, seen, uh, you know, the, the ghost of President's past floating around. So, Judith Romaley, Judith, where are you sitting? Raise your hand. Uh, and and you've had a chance since he's moved back to Portland State. You had a chance to spend any time with her. Uh, you notice he's anything but a ghost. Uh, <laughs> she is still going strong, but. Uh, actually, before I knew she was going to be here today, uh, I've been thinking that, you know, I've read some about major change in higher education institutions. How do you go about creating major change? One of the books that deals with that is a bunch of case studies. And one of the case studies in that is the uh, reconfiguration of our general education curriculum in the mid-90s. You all, some of you were still here, developed the freshman inquiry, sophomore inquiry, the see the caps and all that. And, and it's cited as an example of really truly transformational change. And I think what we're trying to do here today, this whole, not just today, but this whole process of Rethink PSU is transformational change at that level, if not more so. Now to set the stage for it, I'm kind of cheating a bit because I'm actually going to read a lot of quotes to you from an article uh, from uh, the American Interest, and just from the January February issue. And uh, the article is called The End of the University as We Know It. Now, I've, just, I've joked before that there probably hasn't been a year since the Second World War where there hasn't been some article or book that came out with essentially that title, The End of the University as We Know It. And of course, we have shown remarkable resilience. But as I've also said before, I think this time it just may be different. But let me just read some of the quotes. In 50 years, if not much sooner, half of the roughly 4,500 colleges and universities now operating in the United States will have ceased to exist. The future looks like this. Access to college-level education will be free for everyone. The residential college campus will become largely obsolete. Tens of thousands of professors will lose their jobs. The bachelor's degree will become increasingly irrelevant, and 10 years from now, Harvard will enroll 10 million students. The most important part of the college bubble story concerns the impending financial collapse of numerous private colleges and universities and the likely shrinkage of many public ones. The live lecture will be replaced by student video. The administration of exams and exchange of coursework over the internet will become the norm. The push and pull of academic exchange will take place mainly in interactive online spaces. Universities will extend their reach to students around the world unbounded by geography or time zones. All of this will be on offer to at a fraction of the cost of a traditional college education. The internet is a great destroyer of any traditional business that relies on the sale of information. The higher ed business is in for a lot of pain as a new era of creative destruction produces a merciless shakeout of those institutions that adapt and prosper from those that stall and die. Meanwhile, students themselves are in for a golden age, characterized by near universal access to the highest quality teaching and scholarship at minimal cost. Prestigious institutions will dominate this marketplace. Universities of all ranks below the very top will engage each other in an all-out war of survival. One potential source of cost savings for lower-run colleges, that would probably be us, would be to draw from open source courses offered by elite universities. You saw the New York Times yesterday, the article about San Jose State creating a deal with Udacity to use a lot of Udacity courses. Competitive online offerings from other schools will eventually force these nonprofit institutions to embrace the online model, and state governments will put pressure on public institutions to adopt the new open source model once politicians become aware comfortable quality, broad access, and low cost of offers. Online education is like using online dating websites. Fifteen years ago, it was considered a poor substitute for the real thing, even creepy. Now it's ubiquitous. 
talk to your kids. <laughs> to borrow an online analogy, and to borrow an analogy from the music industry, universities have previously sold education in an album package. Before your bachelor's degree in a certain major, coupled with a core curriculum. The trend for the future will be more compact, targeted educational certificates and credits which students will be able to pick and choose from to create their own academic portfolio. Today, when you drive down Music Row in Nashville, the street formerly dominated by the offices of record labels and music publishing companies, you see a lot of empty buildings and rental signs. Severe financial contraction is on the, in the higher ed industry is on the way, and for many, this will spell hard times, both financially and personally. But if our goal is educating as many students as possible, as well as possible, as affordably as possible, then the end of the university as we know it is nothing to fear. Indeed, it's something to celebrate. Now, I don't know how much of this is exactly true. I do know for a fact that one place where he's absolutely wrong, you may recall the opening sentence was in 50 years. This ain't gonna take 50 years. <laughs> This ain't going to take 50 years. We're talking about the changes that are happening now, and I think they're going to play out in the next five, at most 10 years. How exactly they play out? Who will be the survivors? Listen, if I knew all that, I'd be rich. We'd have a lot of problems solved. But we know that if we do not take it seriously, if we do not think hard about it, if we do not try to become a leader, we will be among the roadkill. Now, I feel very strongly that Portland State has some amazing advantages. We have a very clear mission that we've had all along, providing affordable quality education to this region. So we've never been about trying to be elite, trying to be exclusive. It's because we care about providing affordable education of quality to the people in this region that we have to deal with these issues, issues seriously. But it also means we have some real advantages. We do have a bit of what you call a spatial monopoly. There's nobody else, a comprehensive university, that serves this region. That's not to say that all these other people coming in with their online can't start serving these people. There's still an advantage to being here. We have an increasingly wonderful name and reputation, and we see that affirmed every day in the meetings we have around the community. We certainly saw it affirmed last night in the event, event that we had where Cornell West spoke, which was absolutely a galvanizing event for the community. So we have huge advantages. I think the purpose of today is to make sure that we not, do not squander them, that we truly take advantage of them, that we build on them to take it very seriously. The ones doing that are all of you, together, under the leadership of our programs. When I hired Son, uh, last spring, uh, I told her that this was the number one task, the transformation of higher education. Uh, we haven't thought of the Rethink PSU label yet, but I told her the transformation of higher education is the single largest challenge in front of us, and PSU needs a provost who can lead that discussion, because none of us is smart enough to know where we're going what the answers are. This is not a change process where we say, okay, we know we're here, we know we gotta go there, now let's just get the masses to move there. No, we know we're here, we know that iceberg is melting, and we read the book about icebergs, but we don't know exactly what the solutions are. So that's the collective enterprise, to find the solutions. Helping us today with that process is George Mahaffey, uh, who will be the keynote speaker. Uh, George, I've worked with him uh, the last couple of years on a new edition of the Stewards of Place publication that many of you know that came out about 10 years ago that really talked about the role of anchor institutions. We continue to think deeply about what it means to be an anchor institution in this region. That role does not go away, does not change. It takes a different form. Uh, George has been a vice president for academic leadership and change at the American Association of State Colleges and Universities, ASCU, one of our main trade associations. Uh, so he's responsible for managing and developing programs in the area of organizational change and civic engagement and leadership development. So he also organized a lot of conferences. He knows so much about what's going on in hundreds and hundreds of universities 
throughout the country. He has directed a whole series of innovative projects, international programs with China and Liberia uh, and others. And in 2003, he launched what's called the American Democracy Project, which is a big civic engagement initiative. So George truly understands what makes Portland State unique. So, and before coming to ask you, of course, he worked in universities in Texas, New Mexico, and California. Uh, I'm so pleased to have him here. I saw a wonderful article he wrote last year that made me say, he's the guy we want for the opening keynote today. And again, thank you all so much for joining us here today. Please welcome George Mahaffey. Portland State's a special, has a special place in my heart, and I'm thrilled to be here. I've been bragging about Portland State around the country to 110 institutions, or 120 that I've been to over the last 10, 12, 13 years, from the time that Judith was here uh, to, the, to the present day. Uh, you guys were stewards of place before there was such a notion. Uh, so what I want to do today is I want to take you through a quick uh, 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 run. Uh, TR, uh, JR is going to uh, jerk me off the stage if I go too long, so it's a, it's a, a wonderful threat to keep me uh, poised and ready to uh, uh, avoid that kind of uh, fate. So I'm going to get my watch off and make sure I know what I'm doing here. Um, but what, I, what I've done is I've looked across the landscape of our kinds of institutions that, that Bill described so well, uh, and at the same time looked at, at what the literature and the language and the movements are. Uh, and try to give you a sort of a landscape view, a 30,000 foot view. What's particular about this is that what I can tell you is what's going on. What I can't tell you, and what Ben said so well, is that I can't tell you how you solve that problem because that's going to have to be solved by you in the special context and circumstance of Portland State. You have a history, a culture, a circumstance, and all of that's going to play a role. But all of you are going to have to play a role of leadership for this to work. Uh, we are, as uh, uh, not surprising, uh, a massive change in great uncertainty. I, I was saying to uh, uh, Sana and some of our colleagues last night that uh, it's hard for me to even keep up with this. I try to keep the PowerPoint up to date. Uh, Sebastian Thrun offered a MOOC in um, uh, September 2011. Uh, and in the last 12 months, we've heard about edX and Coursera uh, and Semester Online, things that we never even heard of before. Now they're full-blown operation. And yesterday with San Jose, uh, today they announced, uh, uh, SUNY talked about making all the campuses the same and, and data systems across the, the 64 institutions. And th the speed of change is what is as impressive as the nature of change. So let me walk you through this a minute. Uh, this is the, these are the things that I think are really critical. Uh, shifting power, the loss of power by our institution. We had a monopoly uh, once upon a time. The increased power of students to become the agents, the uh, constructors of their own educational experience, and the power of organizations that were previously pre prevented from joining, entering our space by accreditation and lots of other spaces, and suddenly they're there. They're here in in massive numbers and moving very rapidly. Seven critical challenges. The, the first is, the, is perhaps the core problem. Uh, our university model, you remember our universities created in the 11th century, operate on a 19th century variant calendar to prepare students for life in the 21st century. Dr. Phil would say, how's that working for you? <laughs> and the answer is not very well. Let me walk you through the rest and you'll see. Christensen and Iron in, in their uh, new book argue that one of the problems we have is that we're all wannabes. We have not been willing to say, no, we're not going to be like everybody else. We're really going to be distinctive and separate. And so that we have a whole set of, of, of practices uh, that, are, that are similar. Uh, Christensen argues most of them have come from Harvard. Uh, and, and note the conclusion. Confused, multi-purpose missions and unsustainable institutions vulnerable to disruption. The funding model, I don't have to tell you about what's happened to public funding in higher education. Uh, 
state budgets not be balanced until the latter part of the decade. That's 2018. If you're paying attention, I don't want to be talking. I don't want to be here. Uh, uh, well, at least I don't want to be here talking about uh, funding higher education uh, in 2018. I hope. Uh, uh, but healthcare. Uh, folks like me starting to consume more and more of the public dollars for Medicare and Medicaid. Prisons, K-12 schools, guess who, guess who gets hurt? And of course, you know uh, Americans not with a great appetite for taxing. That, kind of, that set of circumstances means that, the, uh, that you're not going to get uh, farther ahead. 44 states in 2012 reporting shortfalls. Uh, and another problem is the cost model. The green line, for those of you in the back of the room, the green line is net tuition. Over 20 years, this is the Delta Project, Jane, Jane Well. Uh, you notice the, the orange line, that's the consumer price index. You can't have that kind of differential between our cost and consumer price index without having major problems. If you want to look at it a slightly different way, uh, this is the uh, trends in college pricing. Again, the blue line there is public four-year universities. And the box line across the bottom is the cost of a new vehicle. Again, you cannot get there from here. Uh, the business model. Business model says that Jane Wellman says that our basic business model is a cross subsidy model. Graduate education subsidized by, uh, un uh, by uh, undergraduate education, upper division subsidized by lower division. You say, well, of course. That's the way we do things. You put a lot of people in the first year classes, you have a small people. Small groups, in the, in the, and then by the time you get to graduate, you have really small groups, right? That's, that's okay. That's the way it is. Well, they did a study of four systems, and they, and, they, and they confirmed this by saying that if the lower division cost was one, upper division was roughly one and a half times as much, a grad one, which is master's, was about three times as much, and doctoral was four times as much. Yeah, that's just the way we do things, right? Well, where's the greatest loss? Well, guess what? The greatest loss is in the first two years. Any problem with that? We're spending the least amount of money and we're, and, and, and we're getting the greatest amount of, of, of loss. Any problem with that? Not for us. But for the students that are suffering, you betcha. You betcha. Mixed outlook, this is a business report. Tuition levels are at a tipping point, meaning that people will no longer be willing or able to pay for that. Middle class incomes have been stagnant or, or have dropped over the last 10 years. So where does, that come, where does that money come from? Higher education must innovate, more centralized management, more efficient use of the facilities, reduction in number of tenured faculty, geographic and demographic expansion, of course, often. We get lots of advice from business, by the way. Bain, not, not Mr. Romney, that's Bain Capital. This is Bain, the consultants. They did a study of uh, uh, University of California, Berkeley, and found just at that one institution $112 million in annual savings by changing the way they did business. You think we have legacy systems that make things inefficient for us? I'd say, yeah. Uh, growing percentages are in real financial trouble. The, fig the figures are something like 30% of all universities, as I mentioned this, particularly in the small privates. 30% uh, are in serious trouble, balance sheets that don't look like they're going to get back. Another 30% are taking on debt at a, a level that's unsustainable. That's about 60% of the population of our institutions. And then just to make it a little more complicated, we have evidence of success or lack thereof. Uh, the Aaron and Ropeska study that many of you saw last year, some people challenge it, but, but well, I'll, I'll take you through a little bit of that. Uh, Further study, they first looked at two-year folks, then they looked at four-year folks. They said, essentially, the conclusion was 36% of the students that graduate from our colleges after four years do not score one iota better in critical thinking uh, tests than when they started four years before. 36%. Now, that sounds bad, but let me give you the rest of it. It's 36% of those who finish. 50% of the students who start don't finish. If you take 36% of the 50 that did, that's another 18%. That means 68% of the American population that is college going does not do well in critical thinking. It explains for me a lot of things, including national elections and a variety of other things. Okay? But for those of you who don't want to think about that, think about this. How about the top uh, the performers? Only 3% were unemployed. Bottom 20%, 9% were unemployed. But here's the one that for those of you who have children in college are about to go to college. Top quintile, only 18% came home. The bottom quintile, 
35% came home. If you do not want your children coming home, make sure they do really well on this CLA. Okay? Otherwise, they'll be home back to that bedroom again. You don't want that. But if you don't like the Airman Ropeska study, you find something flawed with that, go, let's go back to 2006, AIR, uh, Institute of Research. Uh, uh, quantitative uh, literacy. 20% have only basic quantitative literacy skills, unable to estimate if their car has enough gasoline to get to the next gas station. This, this study was, was absolutely enlightening for me. I've always wondered, driving down the freeway, and there's some yokel walking along with a gas can, and I'm thinking, who is that guy? It's a college graduate. <laughs> Graduation rate, 63% of 2000 students, uh, of 2003 students began. Uh, but look at the bottom stat there. 60% in four years. Let me reverse that for you. 40% of your students, my students, our students don't finish. What are the consequences of that metric for this country and our future? The answer is not good. Student debt is now exceeds all credit card debt in the United States, over a trillion dollars. One out of every five households now has student debt. The consequences of that for, for us, for young people starting out, trying to buy cars, homes, get married, have children, find jobs, enormously uh, difficult. But maybe one of the most troubling of these trends is uh, public opinion. Sixty percent of uh, Americans in 2010 said that colleges stay focused more on the bottom line than on, the, on what students care about. And then the recent Time magazine that was a focus on, on uh, college said that in a survey they did, 80% said that many colleges education received was not worth the cost. The curious part was 40% of the presidents who were interviewed also thought that the tuition was not worth the cost. Gordon Gee said it best, the choice for us in this moment is reinvention or extinction. It is as, despite the fact that you could argue that the American Interest article that them referred to was a bit of hyperbole, or at least some parts of it were not, were not true, uh, or, or will not come true, um, it is a moment of extraordinary concern for me. And in four, I, the one thing I can tell you is people get asked me, well, is it, this is really any different that's been going on for? I can tell you this. In four years in higher education, this is different. This is fundamentally different. We have never seen the degree of competition. We have never seen the challenge to the models that we've lived with and used for years and years and years. I will say one thing about the Hardin article that he mentioned, which is that as long, he said residential colleges are going away. As long as they're 18 year olds who don't want to live at home and parents that don't want them there, they're going to have to go somewhere. <laughs> That's the good news. The bad news is there are not as many 18 year olds today as there were five years ago. So that's a different problem. Disruption comes from cheaper and simpler technologies. Vim's argument uh, was the dating service. That's what's happening. They get better and better. One of the things to worry about with loops right now is that they're learning how to deliver massively interesting, engaging courses. So we did the Red Balloon Project. The Red Balloon Project said declining funding, increasing expectations, and a technology revolution. Here's what it was named for. It was named for a DARPA experiment in 2009, which is the 40th anniversary, despite Mr. Gore's assertion, it was the 40th anniversary of DARPA's invention of the internet in 1969, the ARPANET. And what they wanted to do is they wanted to find out how social networking and crowdsourcing were going to be uh, opportunities to think about finding terrorists, finding lost children, whatever else, by crowdsourcing uh, wisdom. So they put up 10 bright red weather balloons across the United States and said, you can find, uh, uh, we'll give you 40,000 bucks to the first person or uh, persons who find all of them. So how long do you think it took to find 10 randomly scattered, 3,000 miles by 2,000 miles, continental in the United States? How long does it take to find 10 bright red weather balloons? By the way, there's not a PhD in, in weather balloon finding that, that, that I know of. It took eight hours and 52 minutes. I said, whoa, Houston, we have a problem. Because for me, the red balloon contest was both a metaphor and an analogy. It's a metaphor for the way that knowledge is being aggregated, uh, discovered, aggregated, and disseminated. And it's an analogy 
for the way that we have to work together collaboratively if we're going to solve this problem. These are these sort of wicked problems, these major kinds of problems. And in the middle of all this, in the middle of all this, technology changes everything. So tell me you recognize these names. Tower Records, Borders, Kodak. Kodak had 95% of the photography business in the world. The problem is they didn't see it coming. The Swiss watchmakers didn't see digital watches coming either, you know, on and on and on. So, uh, it's going to change everything about the way that we do business. But here's what I think is perhaps potentially central to the work. One of the things that we did was, was that we all got PhDs. We got, uh, the old joke is we learned more and more about less and less until we knew everything about nothing, and that was a PhD, right? <laughs> Bad joke from Texas from a long time ago. But, uh, it's probably referred to AM actually, but, I'm, uh, <laughs> but the, the, the point of this was that uh, we depended on the fact that we were the smartest birds in the room. We depended on the fact that we were the experts. And, we de and our whole doctoral program in that cauldron of, of, of socialization, that intensity of socialization, was a solitary, solitary event. We did a dissertation that was ours, that proved that we could work independently as researchers. The fact is that's not uh, as useful anymore as a lot of others. So the, the study is the study of Encyclopedia versus Wikipedia, Journal Nature, and it found that the scientific uh, the accuracy of the entries in both of those, entry, uh, both of those uh, vehicles was roughly similar. Uh, you know about the Encyclopedia Britannica, founded in 1768. But guess what? Last March, 244 years later, Encyclopedia Britannica has quit publishing. Now, that's not the end of the story. The end of the story is they're going to quit, they, they quit printing. The end of the story is they're going to quit publishing. And they're going to do it soon. After 244 years, they are not invulnerable to Wikipedia. Wikipedia is a staff of 30, not for profit. Tell me what the business model is at Encyclopedia. I don't care whether they print it on paper or not. Tell me what the business model is to compete with this. And the answer is there's no way to compete with this. And if you don't believe that, the uh, researchers at the Jackson Cancer Center in Philadelphia found that, that the Wikipedia entries were roughly the same as the oncology textbooks. Again, same story, except they're slightly written at a slightly higher level. Uh, solitary expertise is important, but increasingly network knowledge, crowdsourcing, Sir Wiki's uh, Wisdom of the Crowds. Crowdsource articles, for those of you in English, who are, because I try to offend everybody equally. Uh, uh, crowdsourced articles written by piecemeal, by a variety of people, work as well. Uh, uh, network knowledge, and, and now vast improvements in technology. Moore's Law, double their rate 18 months, cost drops in half. You know that story. Uh, how about this one? Wisconsin appears in the driver's seat, en route to a win. Looks like a typical sports article, right? Except that it's not. It was written by a computer at 30, 60 seconds after the third quarter and it charged $10 for articles of less than 500 words. Watson played Jeopardy. Remember that little game? And Watson beat uh, Ken Jennings. He, you know, what you didn't see is that Watson, of course, and that was, at the time, was a big computer. It's, it'll probably be a handheld in two years. but. Uh, but they, they looked at, uh, evaluated 200 million pages of content in three, uh, every three seconds. You know how, how hard that is to do? I mean, that's really fast. Um, and then uh, artificial intelligence machines. This is uh, Far Farhan Manju uh, from, uh, uh, from the Washington Post. He said, uh, getting so good so quickly, they're poised to replace uh, humans across a wide range of industries. Uh, diagnosing diseases, dispensing medicine, handling lawsuits, and writing stories just like this. Uh, the uh, 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 Air Force recently said that by 2030, the weakest part, of, the weakest component in the Air Force systems will be humans. And uh, another part of Fitch report recently said that uh, not long in the future, uh, predator drones will, will be robots that will not only be able to uh, send hellfire missiles down and kill somebody on the ground uh, uh, 10,000 feet below them, but they'll make the decision as to whether they should or not. Um, science fiction. 
I said, I, I, I made this mistake in Texas of saying this, and uh, I'm going to really get in trouble. The president of the university was sitting in front of me and was an audience like this, and um, I said, well, you know, it, it's Moore's Law every 18 months. Uh, uh, power doubles and cost uh, drops in half, and, technology, and, and meanwhile, we as humans are evolving slowly over hundreds and thousands of years. And I said, well, if we're not, not here in Texas, you, you guys don't have evolution, but where we do have it, <laughs> where we do have it, it, it really is slow. <laughs> so what's changing? What's changing? The role of venture capitalists is probably one of the most significant pieces, and it's why you see Udacity doing what they did in San Jose State yesterday. Uh, this is a graph, for those of you who can't see it, uh, whether it be the sum of equity invested or the number of deals, they both are about the same, and they went along for a, a, a good while uh, from two, 2002, and then all of a sudden in 2011 jumped up. And in 2011, $400 million was spent by venture capitalists uh, in these kinds of startups for higher education. <coughs> Let me say that slightly differently. Last year, year before last now, in 2011, venture capitalists spent $400 million to put you and me out of business. Models now popping up like mushrooms on a warm day. University of the People, tuition free online, 115 countries. New York University said, sure, we'll take credit for that. D DIYU on your comments. Or the Western Governors, brand new, uh, brand new, uh, 1995. I told uh, Sally Johnstone, who's an academic officer there, and uh, she was trying to sell it in New Mexico. And I said, Sally, uh, they said, Dora will sell it to Wilbur. This puppy will never get off the ground. And it worked for about uh, 10 years. They sort of struggled, and 1,000, 1,500, 2,000 students. 30,000 students now. What? Divisions of Western Governors in Indiana, Washington State, and Texas, and going to be another one announced soon. Moving very quickly. Peer-to-peer -peer university, Sebastian Thrun's Udacity, we're going to come back and talk about that. Udemy, uh, small team with a big vision to democratize education. There's a lot of this, and, and this is where I agree wholeheartedly with the, the uh, author of the, the uh, uh, of the Venom's article in American Interest, students are going to really win in this new world. Enabling the top experts to reach any student anywhere and radically lowering the price point. New forms of collaboration and, and sharing the new paradigm initiative, 16 colleges of the South, liberal arts colleges of the South, are going to share courses. So you can take a course with any one of the 16. You know what the analog for that is? Associated Press. When, when newspapers started finding it was too expensive to send journalists all over the world, they, they collaborated with each other. And they started having professors, at, or, or, I'm sorry, uh, reporters from different institutions in different places so they worked together. And by the way, AP, I didn't know this until I looked it up, AP is a not-for-profit wholly owned by its, by, its, uh, by its newspapers. And then they sell some of the content to European and uh, global outlets. But I think this is a really interesting model. The course models are changing. Uh, let me talk about the cottage industry. This is the one we all know and love, and everyone designs a course from scratch themselves. The art, art, artisanal cottage industry model. The example I use is if every institution teaches Psych 101, and every institution has four sections, it means it across 4,000 institutions, it means we teach 16,000 sections of Psych 101 every fall as if it's never been taught before. And we have no clue as to what works and what doesn't, except individually, of course. What I can guarantee you is across those 16,000 sections, there is an enormous range from really good to really bad. If you want to look at a really interesting article about the medical uh, profession and what's happening there, uh, Atul Gawande, who's a surgeon at uh, Brigham and Women uh, in Boston, uh, wrote a, an article recently called Big Med, and he compares medicine to the Cheesecake Factory. And it's a really fabulous article called Big Men. It's really interesting. It essentially says, why can't we get the same kind of quality? I'll put that in quotation marks uh, for some of you. Uh, uh, why can't we get, let me say it here. Why can't we get the same level of consistency of, of outcome that 
with 84,000 whatever it is, cheesecake factory things, that, but we can't get it in medicine. We have 100,000 people die again uh, every year in hospitals and things like that just from having been in hospitals. Uh, and his question, which is really the challenge for you, is he said, why can't we get that consistency but without dehumanizing the work? Because he said the consistency at Cheesecake means that people are essentially in, in rote jobs without much creativity. What we have is a high creativity but high failure rate and incredible lack of consistency. Uh, another is the Open University of the UK, really where it's starting, the University of Phoenix. Lots of resources put into courses. And then, uh, but it's taught by lower level, uh, lower paid folks in essentially a similar way. You've got the venture capitalists. Uh, uh, people were startled to see that Udacity yesterday joined with the, uh, the California State University. Guess what? That's not new. John Katzman was doing that with USC. I asked uh, uh, Karen Gallagher, the, the Dean of Education at the, the USC, I was with her on a panel somewhere, Taiwan or something weird like that. But I said, so, uh, so what's going on? And she said, we're offering an MIT degree for $40,000. And I said, but it's online. It ought to be cheaper. She said, it's a USC degree or whatever. 800 plus people signed up for it. 40,000 bucks a pop. John Katzman gets about 70% of that. I said, why in the world would you want to work with an online for-profit provider? And she said three things. She said, a website to die for, worldwide marketing, and $20 million in venture capitalists the capital that we raised right away. I love the comment yesterday by the one of the respondents to the article about Udacity and CSU. They're offering the faculty 15 grand each to start the course, to design the course. And uh, I said, and he said, I just hate to see it in a partnership with a for-profit. Well, I, have you seen many not-for-profits be able to pump, put 15 grand on the table for designing courses? We don't have this. We we don't have the structures to do that. Uh, individual course offering, my friend Bert Smith, straighter line, courses for 99 bucks each. And now, of course, the MOOCs. And the, the, the poster child for this is Sebastian Trump's course, 200 students at Stanford, Intro to uh, Artificial Intelligence. Do you really want to go up against this guy? This is a guy that figured out how to drive cars without human beings involved. Okay? And they've driven, what, 20, 30, 40,000 miles without even a scratch? across all kinds of conditions and circumstances. Uh, and now he's offering the MOOC, 160,000 people, uh, 44 languages. The best part of the story is that of the 200 Stanford students in the course, only 30 were still there at the end. I think there's a message there. Uh, now it's edX and Coursera. Well, the MOOCs are not their credit, so what's the problem? Well, Cale, uh, Passion, the Pennsylvania system, said, oh, no, we'll work with Council for Adult and Experiential Learning, and guess what? We'll give credit. So if students want to take the course, we'll give them credit after the fact. He said, uh, John uh, Kavanaugh, who's, who's currently the, the chancellor up there, said, you know, we take transfer credits from all sorts of people. This isn't any different. Well, it isn't in one sense, but it could be in another. Um, the most important thing is that these campuses are going to learn how to deliver high quality, engaging courses to large, large, large numbers of people. And that's where, and you don't see any of our institutions involved in those right now. And that's where I think we're in trouble. Semester online, brand new, and this is the end of the MOOC year, uh, year of 2012. Uh, fully online, credit bearing courses. Uh, Why, well, Duke, you can, you can now buy a course from Duke for 4,000 bucks and get credit. <laughs> I don't even want to do it. So, um, uh, and, and even supersized classes, I saw one of those in the, the list here. Supersized classes of uh, uh, Professor Virginia Tech on world regions for uh, to 2,670 students. The part I love the best, you know, Skype and Twitter and you know, all these various technology. But he said, you can come to class or you can be online. And you can come to class this week and be online next week. I don't care. It's all, the boundaries are, are starting to just disappear. The boundaries that we have historically in our head thought about. Uh, analytics and personalization, we're starting to see some amazing work. This is the big data language that you hear about people talking about, where you take all the data that this institution already has about demographics and student characteristics, past performance, and you marry it with the, the, the current stuff that you're getting from the individual classes, and you can be incredible predictive analytics. Austin P. In, in Tennessee, the, Tristan Denley, the provost there, 
Uh, they've got courses now that they can tell you with about an 85% accuracy based on one week of performance in the class. One week of performance in the class, married with all this other data, they can give you an 85% accuracy, uh, 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 with a, predict with 85% accuracy whether this, they will be uh, successful in the course. Which means you could do all kinds of interventions to make sure more students were successful. Um, lots of information for the, uh, uh, Tristan uses it to predict the number of, uh, of uh, uh, sections of various courses that are needed. Uh, there's all sorts of things that predictive analytics does. Uh, there's a lot of work now going on with reducing cost relative to the, the high cost. Uh, state of Washington, Rice and Temple, and lots of people creating self-created textbooks. You've seen a lot of that work. And then a lot of work, particularly in the, the Maryland system, around reducing costs by taking all the courses back to 120 hours, reducing the, the impact on campus. 10% 10, 10 of the coursework has to be done off campus. Uh, you can do it in internships, you can do it in uh, global uh, online courses, you can do it of, uh, study abroad, whatever you want, but you can't be on campus, suddenly you free up 10% of the, the physical space on campus. Uh, lots of it, focus now on measuring success. Um, lots of organizations out there and lots of ways to be more and more specific about uh, learning outcomes. And then for me, one of the most interesting discussions going on right now is threats to the credential uh, itself. Um, there are people now saying, you know, the baccalaureate degree doesn't, if, if, when I report to you I have a baccalaureate degree from the University of Washington <laughs> in history, you don't have a clue. You know that I probably took 30 to 40 hours in, uh, in history. You probably know that I took some gen ed uh, distribution requirements. I probably took some electives. I probably was there four years. Uh, and I was probably bored to tears, so I at least did some time during that time, and I may have had too much to drink. But you don't know anything about my capacity and capability, and so what if a degree was instead a collection of badges or a collection of certifications? Could be. Uh, the, the, and, and there are a lot of people who are now act, act, actively saying, we're going to bypass the whole, we don't care whether you have a degree. We, what we want to know as an employer is what you can do. And because the degree doesn't tell us anything, we're going to ignore whether you have a degree or not. What we're going to do is make sure you have the kinds of capacities and capabilities that we're interested in. Uh, so you're starting to see all kinds of badges and other forms of certification. So the question then becomes, where do we go from here? And it's a three-part challenge. And this is the part that's really terrifying. We've got to get, educate more students to greater learning outcomes at lower cost. We have to do all three things, not just one. You could do one of the three pretty easily, but you can't do all three easily. The key question, and it's the question you all are struggling with here today, is what's the value that you add? What's, what's the unique value that you add that no one else can add? And for faculty members, it's the same question. What's the unique value that I add that no one else can add? So what's likely to change? We're going to see a lot of change in course design. You know about the flipped courses. The argument is that you go home to watch the lecture, you come to class to work with others. Because the question is, why do you assemble people together? If it's only to sit quietly, I, don't, I know the irony of this discussion now. <laughs> we go there. We, but, but see, but, but I have an answer for you, by the way. See, I don't trust that you all did the homework last night. Because if, if I did, did trust, I would have given you the, my, my PowerPoint last night and we could have had a conversation. But I'm confident that somehow this is going to work. You know, work so. But flip courses, lots of popularity around that. The con is really popularized. Eric Missouri at Harvard really did spend a lot of time thinking about it. But Khan Academy has really done it. And what we're now starting to see is that the MOOCs, uh, uh, Antioch just bought a, a purchase MOOCs because MOOCs actually are not free. They're licensed so that you can't use them for educational purposes except individually. You can't, institutions can't grab them. But you're going to start seeing what Antioch did was simply to buy them to use as the lecture portion and that's the homework. So you're seeing the MOOCs sort of accelerating this flip process. Uh, the OLI at Carnegie Mellon, some of the best work going on in the country right now. This is teams of people building courses together. It's not just the discipline specialist, it's the educational designer, it's the, the computer scientist thinking about human-machine interaction, it's a whole suite of people, much like the medical model 
that it takes a, a suite of people to, to, to treat uh, disease. Uh, free courses, there are a lot of free courses there. They're available. Here's one of the SAP course. is a really interesting study. They, they did a SAP course uh, in, in this way where you, you go through it uh, your own pace and where you have trouble it, it responds to that. They found that you could teach a SAP course in half the time with as much uh, a learning outcome and with greater retention uh, than in a conventional uh, uh, semester-long course. Uh, Carl Wyman, uh, Carl has two distinctions uh, that are not available to anybody else. He's a, a Nobel Prize winner in physics and he's also the Carnegie Professor of the Year. There's literally no one else on earth with those two designations. And, and Wyman studied science and why it's difficult, particularly physics. He said it's about reducing cognitive load, or addressing belief, and stimulating and guiding thinking. And he said, uh, so he did a little experiment. He had one senior professor, well regarded, lots of experience, teaching the course, but without understanding about cognitive load and addressing beliefs and things like that. And he had a brand new professor, but trained in that, and the brand new professor, the learning outcomes of students were twice as great as the learning outcomes of the senior professor. Popular, well liked experience in the, in the line. The math emporium, you start to see that. 500 students in Virginia Tech was sort of popularized in this. 500 students in a room, all taking different courses and all taking the courses in slightly different ways as they move through, depending on what their particular needs are. You're going to see a lot of uh, computer personalization uh, of. of uh, I mean, after all, when you sit, when you walk into a room as a class, you normally say, we're going to start here, and we're going to end there. Oh, I know some of you are here, some of you are here, some of you are here, but my God, we're going to start over here and walk you through all of it, right? That's just the way we do things. Uh, but it doesn't have to be that way, and that's what some of this kind of stuff is. And then Carol Tweet's done a bunch of other stuff. Lots of savings in large enrollment classes. Uh, average savings of 40%. Again, lots of places where we could... We can actually reduce the cost of our operations. And then the blended courses, one of the ones that I'm most excited about now is blended. Uh, the blended is, uh, it, it, this is one model of blended, is you take a typical three-hour course, you split it in half, uh, and so you have half face-to-face -face and half of it is web-enabled, cloud-based, whatever you want to do. And there are multiple ver variations on that. But what I really like about it, and first of all, they did a meta-analysis and they looked at all learning outcomes uh, across different types of, of, of class modalities, and they were really comparing online to face-to-face, -to -face, and they found that online was slightly better than face-to-face, -face, but hybrid was better than either of the other two models. And I think John Naismith was right. I thought that thing. And so I'm intrigued by this. I'm particularly intrigued because I think that what happens is, I, I said at a Sloan conference once, I, I, in a, a joke, I said that uh, uh, hybrid uh, learning is the uh, uh, gateway drug to online education because you, you suddenly see that you can get lots of data from the online portion of it while you still get to encourage and support and nurture and, 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 understand, and try to deal with people's perplexities and misunderstandings and things like that. I think there's a huge opportunity there. Uh, you've seen George Kuh's broad uh, uh, high impact practices, a lot of those. What else is likely to change is a lot of free materials. Uh, one of the things I ask is that there, there are now about uh, 15,000 free courses across the United States, or uh, out in the internet somewhere. How many are you using here at Portland State to reduce costs, improve student learning, increase access? By the way, that, that's, a, that's a trick question, because the median answer at, at the last 30 institutions I've been at, the median answer is zero. We don't do those. It's either made here or it's really not any good, right? I mean, that's our model. Uh, and so we have the uh, uh, OER, uh, and, and, and you know, Hewlett has spent about $110 million on free and open source materials over the last few years. Um, and so I, it, it's a challenge to say, how could you use free materials, free courses? How could you use this material to change the way that you access, and, and uh, who was it, Kathy Davidson, that said, if, if, I could be, if I can be replaced by a computer screen, I should be. I should be. Because the point is, is what, what is really critical that I can deliver, that no one else can deliver, and that no machine can deliver, no technology can deliver. Jeff Salingo, who's a great observer, he's an editor at the Chronicle and a really terrific guy, a great observer, said that he imagines an, uh, an era where introductory courses or commodities offered free or close to free. The question at the bottom is, 
What happens to your business? Remember cross subsidies? What happens to your business model for the first two years in terms of funding go away? <coughs> what happens to your opportunity to do the upper division in the graduate level? Randy Bass, uh, uh, Professor Georgetown, uh, said, I think we're in the post-course era. He went around the Georgetown campus and said to students there, what's the most, tell me about the most powerful educational experience you've had at this university, and no one reported it was in a class. He said, maybe we need to not, not have classes anymore. We need to, or courses anymore. You need to think about something else. What else is likely to change the nature of faculty work? Changing teaching from solitary to collective work with other faculty and with other specialists. I think we're going to see crowdsourcing in ways we can't imagine. We're working right now on a model where we have faculty from 10 different universities design a course together, deliver it as a blended model. The course gets better and better and better. More and more people throw in ideas. Faculty individually spend less time having to design the course from scratch. Um, and we've, we've even figured out a sustainability model for it. Uh, and I, I think the most important part of this faculty change is that we've always had a model that's essentially a, a teaching scholarship and service, uh, like we're all been stamped out of the same damn cookie cutter. The, one, there's no reality in that. And two, it, it ignores all the ways that we could imagine faculty doing great things with students, including, I was saying this song this morning, uh, imagine a circumstance in which a faculty member was working with students but actually not talking to them or interacting with them. Because they, the faculty member was designing the circumstance within which students learn. As a recovering academic, I, I discovered not long ago that students actually learn outside of class. I was astounded. <laughs> I was absolutely horrified. They learn with student affairs professionals. They learn uh, with other students. They learn in all sorts of settings other than the ones that I'm managing and directing for them. In fact, our job in the 21st century is to create learning environments for students. Not create courses, not create programs. Create learning environments for students. I was arrogant enough at the time. Uh, I, Got, hopefully got past it, but I uh, was arrogant enough to say they only learned actually in my class. <laughs> and actually they only learned in my class when I was talking. And it turns out that was probably the time that they were learning the least. Uh, I think we're going to change. The old model was a single expert, my classroom, closed up door, and the serious black box. And the new model is going to be network, model, collaboration. Even students will be contributing to how you design courses because they actually have a lot of good ideas. Um, focus on learning outcomes, there's no question. If there is one coin in the realm, if there's one coin in the realm, it is learning outcomes. That will be the goal standard. That's the only thing that matters. What kind of treatment do you use? What, what modalities do you use? I don't care. There's only going to be one goal standard. As our famous uh, former president said, is our students learning? <laughs> That's the goal standard. Uh, and the paradigm model, the most important single course, I, I, the most important single article I ever read was the one by Barn Tag in 1995. And they said the problem with our universities is that they're teaching institutions. So the ends and the means are the same. As long as you teach, you've done what you're supposed to do. But the real kind of institution we ought to have is learning institutions. And they're, they're mean, the means and the ends are separated. And the only time that the means are good is when they <coughs> create the ends, or you throw out the means. Uh, we did a lot of that study, and the, there's a, a focus on student success, and there's some of that. Yeah. Uh, so uh, some quick core ideas. Uh, these are sort of things that are sort of meta pieces of this. Uh, blended, whatever can be done by technology, you ought to let it be done. And what you ought to do is focus on what you do best. Um, learning outcomes is going to be the point of the realm. Boundaries are going to become porous. Uh, almost, uh, so what's a course? Uh, I was talking to my friend at the University of Central Florida last week in Tennessee. He said people are starting to ask us, why do we have courses? Why do we have semesters? Students actually continue learning beyond the semester when we say, oh, oh course is over. Uh, data, rich data, data analytics. We've got to pay attention to data and be, we'll be driven by data. Uh, structures, we're going to change first year, we're going to change uh, what's a major, what's a degree, lots of things are going to change, and then cost has got to be a consideration. 
the ultimate question for our institutions, can we transform ourselves before we're disrupted? Challenge is enormous. Confusion of purposes, distorted reward structure, limited success, high cost, massive inefficiencies, and profound resistance. Other than that, <laughs> we're good to go. <laughs> Matt Miller said that America's economy is caught up in a race between innovation and calcification, between the power of new ideas to uh, lower costs and boost quality, and the power of entrenched interests to protect their habits and incomes, which are weak. So let me end with a cautionary tip. You've heard about the Pony Express. Everybody's heard about the Pony Express. And you saw it in the article. I put it at the front of the article, but I put it at the back of this thing. Uh, young, skinny, wiry fellows. Oh, they'll live that way again. One, uh, not that I ever was, but uh, uh, 18, willing to risk death daily. Orphans preferred 25 bucks a week. Uh, that was five times kind of the going away at the time. Uh, great trip, 1,900 miles to 10 mile stations. Imagine the cost of setting up stations every 10 miles. Station master. Oats, hay, water, across a hostile west, right? But it reduced letter delivery from 24 days to 10 days. You know it started April 3rd, 1860, but do you remember when it ended? <laughs> do you remember when it ended? And do you know why it ended? Because the completion of the transcontinental telegraph made it irrelevant. Disruption is not new. It's just accelerated. Attributed to Darwin, but apparently not actually said by Darwin is that the strongest of the species, but it, it illustrates the point, so I continue to use it with the correction at the note. I noted at the bottom, it's the one most adaptable to change. I wish that you at Fort State are those adaptable creatures that survive. both Vim and George for setting the table for us today. Um, I think that their remarks are going to really help us as we, as we move throughout, uh, throughout today. Um, I also want to thank all of you for participating. I know you've got really busy schedules. And in addition to those of you that are in the room, um, there are those that are watching us live streaming, um, I suppose, anywhere in the world. Um, but I would imagine mostly here on the Portland State campus. And we also have some students with us, which is really great. We have representatives from ASPSU. We have our president from ASPSU. We have some of the students from the University Mentors Program and some student ambassadors. And I think their perspective is going to be very helpful um, for us as well. So um, I also want to make sure I thank, you know, this is always an important thing, and oftentimes it's done at the end when there's no one left in the room. I do want to thank a number of people who have really done a tremendous job to help us get this going. And the first is Donna Berg, and Donna, oh, she's sitting right down here. Donna Berg, who many of you know from the provost office, has paid attention to every single detail, including the fact that there are power cords, power strips, scattered around the perimeter of the room for those of you who need to plug in on occasion uh, to power um, your laptops or whatever you have. She did tell me it's like the airport and that you have to try to hunt for one um, and that it's not like the um, gold club um, lounge that you can go to at the airport, but there are those. But there are also a number of other people who are working and have been working really hard to make this happen and I really want to thank all of them. So what do we want to do in this next 50 minutes. What would we like to, uh, to accomplish? Um, again, we're not doing the sort of normal Q&A, but what we want to do is have a conversation. We want you to have a conversation. And we want you to have that conversation based on things that you've heard that were both said by Vim and George, based on what you know, what you don't know. Um, and really to do it around three questions that will provide the scaffolding for that. And those three questions are up here on the screen. They're also on the tent cards on your tables. And the reason they're on the tent cards on your tables is, is that in a while the questions will disappear from the screens. 
because what we will be doing is we will not be doing any reporting out. I'm going to repeat that, and then I expect an applause. There will be no reporting out. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to have you be tweeting. Wait a minute, I think I've got that right, or you're twittering. Um, so if you haven't already done so, and you're inclined, you should open your Twitter accounts. And there are instructions at your table um, on doing that. And by the way, for those of you that are new to Twitter, I found out yesterday Twitter is the noun or adjective and tweeting is the verb. So you're going to open your Twitter accounts and then you're going to tweet. We'll be using the hashtag that is the number sign rethink underscore PSU. And we will have the screen actually having what's called a Twitter fall, which are all the Twitters, actually streaming on this screen as you're all having your conversations. So the way we envision this working is, is that at your tables, you'll be talking about what you heard this morning using these three questions, again, as a scaffolding. We don't expect you to answer each one of these questions but to use them as a way to have the conversation. You'll be talking amongst yourselves at your table as a group or as individuals at any time during that conversation. You should be tweeting and other people at, in this room, all of the rest of you, I mean all of you, I shouldn't say the rest of you, are going to be not only talking but multitasking and looking at the tweets and commenting on each other's comments. What we will do with all of that is we will take all of that information and use it this afternoon in the culminating session that we have in order to ask questions um, that you've raised of our three panelists that we will have, which will be George, Vim, and then the, uh, Rob Dash, our presiding officer of the Faculty Senate. <laughs> so again, what we'd like you to do for the next 50 minutes is we'd like you to really talk about the things you heard this morning, the things you've been thinking about, the things you don't know about in the context of these questions. As you do that, you're going to be tweeting away, and that's really going to be our record for what you're all thinking about. So I should ask if there's any questions, but I won't be able to answer them because I don't, I, if they're technical, I won't be able to answer them. Um, so um, I'm just going to say to you, sort of ready, set, go. I will come back in 50 minutes and get us going on the rest of our program.
this certified is pretty cool. It'll, it'll come in together, everything that I'm getting, the building like the mirror, and we can then publish it later.
to everyone. But I don't I can't whistle really loud, but I don't know if you just all saw the tweet that said SADA will be announcing a break now. <laughs> um, we're gonna take a ten minute break um, and then ask that everybody be back in their seats um, by eleven o'clock. And you can be tweeting all day. <laughs> And also sending emails to rethink at pdx.edu. And then when we start up the session at 11 o'clock, we'll also, I'll also give you some instructions on how you can comment on particular proposals on the website as well. So, 10 minute break. Um, this has been great stuff up here, and I'll talk a little bit about it when we come back.
Number one is speed up. Can I ask everybody to grab their last bit of coffee and whatever it is so that we can get started again? So I'd like, I'd like to get us going again because we've got a really sort of big agenda. You know, first of all, there were thousands of tweets um, and it was just really great. To, uh, to be reading them, getting a sense of what you're all thinking. Those are available um, on the Twitter site, but they are also going to be on the Rethink uh, website at uh, our Rethink uh, PDX.edu site. So they'll be there. And again, I remind you that you can continue to, to do this throughout the day as things come up and you have questions or you want to make comments, um, or you'd like somebody to know what you're thinking. Um, second of all, I, I realized I met somebody at the break and I realized I never introduced myself and I just assumed this is quite an assumption. I just assumed everybody on campus knew who I was. Um, so I, I'm Sana Andrews and, and I'm your provost, so. <laughs> well, you're laughing, but you know, I just, I, it's, I've only been here six months, so. Anyway, um, in, a, in a minute I'm going to ask our first presenters um, that are going to be uh, presenting in this next hour to kind of cue themselves up, but I've got a couple of comments that I want to make. Um, and to kind of tell you how the rest of the morning will go and how the early afternoon will go. So, Aside from a short break for lunch, which is about 20 minutes or so, you're hopefully, we're going to be spending the next four hours listening to a number of the ideas that were submitted as part of the Provost Challenge. And I would like to make it really clear to people that the Provost Challenge is only one initiative under this Rethink PSU. And it's really the first initiative under the Rethink PSU. And I've appreciated tremendously everybody's patience and cooperation and understanding as we, as I keep describing it, are laying down the railroad tracks as the train is moving on this. And so you've all been very wonderful in, in your patience on that, and I appreciate it very, very much. Um, one of the essential components of the Provost Challenge has been the public nature of it. We made, at the very beginning, a decision that said proposals can come from any faculty member, and in the case of the Inspiration Challenge, from staff members, but it can come from any faculty member. We said it needed to be not one individual, but a group. We decided that it wouldn't need any approvals at this stage. So it wasn't like you had to have your department chair or your dean or a committee say, boy, that's a good idea or that's not a good idea. And the reason we did that was is that we designed a process that we hope is formative. It's a process where people were willing to put ideas out there, to look at each other's ideas, to have the entire campus be able to comment on those ideas, for you to find collaborators based on those ideas, and to revise the work that you're doing based on what you're hearing. Um, and it's, it's a little disconcerting, I think, for some folks, because the rules, we didn't have like rules, and we still don't have rules. And it's hard when you're trying to generate ideas to have rules, because we only know what we know and we don't know what we don't know. And so I've been really impressed, and I actually read all 162 proposals. Uh, Supont um, Jar also read them as well. Um, over the, Monica, don't, over the time we were closed. <laughs> um, but I read every single one of them, and I was really, really, really impressed with the, with the ideas. So we had over 160 of these, and our initial thought was, we before we knew we had 160, that we were going to have all of them present at the symposium. So of course, 160, you do the math, uh, it doesn't work very well, um, unless you want to all stay here for the next 
72 hours. Um, so what we're going to do today is we're going to feature um, a number of them, um, 25 of them. And then tomorrow and Friday, we're going to feature the remaining ones at all-day sessions that will be taking place over at University Place. And if you go to the Rethink website, there is a schedule that will tell you which presentations are taking place at which time, and anyone is welcome to come to those. I will be there all day on both days to, to hear those presentations. So how did we pick the 25? Because you're at, you want to know, right? Don't you want to know how we picked the 25? Maybe you don't. But you, some of you are asking, how'd you pick the 25? There, and I'm, I'm just, you have to trust me. I'm so honest about this. There's no judgments being made at this time. Because really what we ask you to do is put out ideas that we, again, want to be able to have shaped and formed by the conversation. What we did decide to do is we did decide to restrict the ones we selected for the symposium today to be around the reframing challenge. And for those of you who aren't really familiar with the Provost Challenge, there are three parts of it. There was the acceleration challenge, how do we quickly move some degrees online, create some new degrees with existing degrees. There was the inspiration challenge, which were these smaller ideas around ways in which we can improve student success. And then this other category called the Reframing Challenge, which really was sort of a kind of the open competition, so to speak, in terms of not really identifying what the category was, but asking for uh, different kinds of, of concepts. So we decided to focus on the Reframing Challenge. We had 47 of those, and we picked half of them. Um, and it was really trying to get a sense of variety so if we had a number of proposals that were similar, we might have only picked one. So that we could give all of you who are participating in the symposium a sense of that variety. But again, tomorrow and Friday, all day over at University Place, um, you can come and listen to, to the remaining ones. So I'm going to ask our presenters, right, I'm going to have a few more things to say, but I'm going to ask the presenters for the first couple to kind of queue up and then I'll lay out the game plan here. So our presenters have been briefed on the protocol, and they will have five minutes to give their presentation. Now some people go, oh my gosh, how can we give a presentation in five minutes? Don't you think that's better than a half hour presentation? <laughs> um, you know, um, a number of us have lately gone to professional meetings where, in fact, they've had presentations like this where people have five or ten minutes to give a presentation and it's amazing what you can learn in five or ten minutes. But they'll have five minutes. Um, JR um, and uh, is down here. You know what? JR stand up. JR agreed to serve as the bouncer. <laughs> <laughs> and if anyone goes over their time he's going to yank them sort of off the off the stage. Um, there will be no Q&A, um, and it, at least not in the traditional sense. So you're not going to be able to ask questions. But you will be able to Twitter, and you will be able to send things to the PDX um, dot, excuse me, PDX, uh, excuse me, rethink at pdx.edu website. And you can also pull up on your computer the proposals and in the proposals, there is a comment section. So what you have at your tables on a yellow sheet is the order of the presentations. And if you go to the website, what you'll be able to do is you'll be able to pull up the proposals and you'll be able to comment on them. So you can comment in a variety of ways. You can comment by using your the, 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 the Twitter, you can comment by sending to rethink at pdx.edu, and you can comment directly on the web page for the proposal. If you're going to comment at the, by, by, on the tw uh, by tweeting or at the pdx.edu website, or excuse me, email, please give us the proposal number because we won't know what you're commenting on. 
unless it's a general a general comment that you that you make. So I am going to um, sort of turn it over right now to um, the the first presenter again. Um, let me ask if, does anyone need time to sort of get to the symposium page if they need to on the, their computers? And if you have trouble getting to that, some people, a couple people wait, raise their hand. Okay. So what you want to be able to do is go to rethink.pdx.edu. That will get you to the website. And then on the left-hand side, I probably should show it, but I... We're queued up to have someone's presentation. On the left-hand side, you will see a link for the symposium presentations. If you click on the symposium presentations, what will come up then in order will be the 25 proposals that are being proposed today. Okay. Well, with that, I'm going to now um, just turn the podium over to the first presenter, and then we will go through them. I will then come up and let you know when we have our break for lunch. I'm going to present a laboratory platform that could be used to train our students for 21st century jobs. As you might expect, as things evolve, nanotechnology has become very important. And so my uh, proposal to you is how do we teach a laboratory in nanoscience? And so you will hear a little bit of video. Richard Feynman Sorry. gave a talk at Caltech. In December 1959, five years before he was to get his Nobel Prize, Richard Feynman gave a talk at Caltech entitled, There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom. The talk is often cited as the beginnings of nanoscience, the study and manipulation of matter at the scale of nanometers, one billionth of a meter, or 100,000 times less than the thickness of a human hair. Or as Feynman put it, a staggeringly small world that is down below. Nanotechnology will create revolutionary products based on physical, biological, and chemical principles. Virus-sized computer chips. Nanorobots for biological transport. Nanosensors for detecting molecules. Nanotechnology labs are expensive, costing millions of dollars. Why? Just like the song says. And so my friend is blowing in the wind. The answer is blowing in the wind. Floating dust particles destroy nano devices. So expensive clean rooms are needed to create a dust-free environment for manufacturing. Our students build a clean room for a staggering cost of $10,000 aided by private and industrial donations. Now we're inside the clean room. You can see, I cannot fit a glass of 50 in the clean room. Our first station is the spin coater, where we apply a photoreactive material to the silicon wafer. The next station is the hot plate, where we bake off the solvent. And then we transfer the wafer to the UV projection aligner. 
the UV aligner projects the image of the mask onto the wafer. The next step is development, where we dissolve the exposed image in the photoresist. The developed wafer looks like this. The final step is to inspect the developed pattern. The rise in the educational cost have outpaced the rate of inflation. So our solution must be, as Gordon Moore, the founder of Intel, once said, faster, better, and cheaper. Our proposal is inspired by Arthur C. Clarke's iconic book, 2001, A Space Odyssey, and, of course, Steve Jobs. It's beautiful. It's intelligent. Even genius. Our vision is to use head-mounted iPhones to A, broadcast experiments live on Wi-Fi through Echo 360. B, to receive and act upon live feedback from TA, professor, and global audience of students. C, to allow for learning by observation, repetition, and correcting mistakes. This is how we plan to bring an interactive laboratory online. The funding will be used to develop software and hardware for better and faster interactivity, and also for remote control over the instruments. A live shot from Google Handout illustrates the need to improve the user experience. Thank you. Uh, this video that you saw was collected on an iPhone, mounted on the head. The essential issue we're trying to address is how do you teach students how to do an experiment? So if you mount a head on the head, your iPhone, I like you can do this. And that's Folks, looks like a whole bunch of people, that is us, have logged on to the Rethink PDX <laughs> website, which is probably pulling the site down, yeah. which in itself is a great lesson for us. So I would just ask some of us to log off so we can just see the presentation. We'll do the comments later. Let's take this and see if we can make it work. Otherwise, the presenters will have to come and do it the sort of the way we do it in most of our classes. But the presentations will go on. Let's try this. Let's try to power things down for a minute, log off of the rethink.pdx side, and see if we can make it work. Great lesson for us. <laughs> You know, that makes me feel better. Last night as I was trying to get my presentation together, I felt like the kid with an Atari trying to learn how to play uh, Xbox. I mean, when did the world change? I thought PowerPoint was good. I have a PowerPoint as well. Um, 
desktop. Let me just see if I can find my Sure, technology is making the world better. People don't have this problem, they have to never get disconnected. They just kill it. They always know that. Yeah, they're quite free. Okay, hi. How's it going? I think, we're, uh, I think we got something going here. Hi, my name's uh, Jeremy. Hi, my name is Jeremy Parra. As you can uh, read there, Mark Twain reminding us or confirming our sneaking suspicion that um, sometimes what we're doing in the classroom is no better than a pre-printing press uh, copy room. But I don't think that the lecture is necessarily dead. I think when we consider what happened to the lecture, it's just changed formats, just like the lecture of old has uh, moved to a book. Now we can get so much content online. And I don't think this is something to despair. In fact, I think it's wonderful. I had a student the other day ask me if he could find the content in Chinese, and I was able to direct them to it. But the question is, is what we're going to do with the space once we've put everything online? And so Scale Up PSU is an idea for what we can use our classrooms for. And so when we think about the space that we have, I think we should think, what can we do that's pedagogically relevant and good? And it turns out that the lecture maybe belongs on an iPad. What we can be doing in the classroom is the ability for groups to come together to teach each other, for us to interact as peers and as instructors with our peers. So I wanted to take a second to show a video that summarizes this better than I could do in uh, the 30 minutes that I allotted myself. Robert Beekner, an award-winning professor of physics at North Carolina State University, knew there had to be a better way to teach introductory physics than in a large lecture hall. In a large class, students can get lost. The one factor that makes the most difference in student success is whether they feel like someone cares how they perform. So the quality of the relationships that students have with other students and with their faculty makes all the difference in the world. And so the Scale-Up Classroom was designed to facilitate those interactions between students and with faculty. Scale-Up, which originally stood for Student-Centered Activities for Large Enrollment, University Physics, is part of Beekner's life's work to study and improve science, technology, engineering, and math education. From the physical setup of the classroom to the delivery of information and the use of technology, Scale Up isn't your mother's physics class. Instead of the professor delivering formulas, rules, and other content, students gather that information from the web and then work in teams, making measurements and observations in class, applying the content they learn to solving problems. What used to happen is the content was delivered in the classroom, students would struggle with it doing homework outside. We've reversed that so that the content they pick up outside and they struggle with the harder aspects of the content in class where they've got help. The traditional lecture hall is uh, sometimes characterized as a, a place where information passes from the notes of the instructor to the notes of the student without going through either head. And that really doesn't work for employers who keep telling us that they want graduates who are critical thinkers. The classroom is made up of many large tables for nine students, each with their own laptop. There are wall and portable whiteboards to work out experiments, large monitors to share information, and lab equipment. Students at each table work together to solve problems, while the professor roams around the classroom. The major advantage of that is they learn from each other, and more importantly, as I sit and listen to them, I learn what they don't know. 
you see them go down the wrong direction sometimes because everybody agrees that's the right direction. But more often you see somebody say, wait, that can't be, and give a cogent reason for why that is. The failure rates of students at North Carolina State University using Scala for introductory physics courses has dropped threefold overall. But for African American students, the drop is nearly fourfold. And for women, it's about fivefold, two groups who are underrepresented in the sciences. And one of the features of the scale up model is this collaborative environment where a diversity of students are working together and each brings their own worldview, their own spin on a problem to bear. And there's a lot of literature that indicates when you bring a diversity of experience and worldviews to tackling a problem, you get better answers. So in our proposal for Scale Up PSU, um, we're recommending to take advantage of the change in format of the traditional lecture um, and take advantage of the classroom that's going to be freed up. We're not spending that time lecturing now. Hopefully now we can spend that time doing some of these more active learning um, environments. So uh, both proposing to create the classroom space we need. Right now I'm using Hoffman, which is a little cumbersome, and also the curriculum that goes along with this. So as we think about our motto, let knowledge serve the city, I would add something to that. And knowledge will continue to serve on the online format. But let's let our place also serve our minds. So let's use our place to serve our minds. And let's use timing a little bit better next time so that things will actually roll when I say them. So uh, <laughs> let our place serve the city. That's, uh, that's our recommendation for Scale Up PSU. Thank you for your time. Hi, I'm Bill Becker. I'm the director of the Center for Science Education, and uh, my uh, proposal that I'm presenting is number 203. Um, Portland uh, State University is positioned to play a major role in improving student success um, in science, technology, engineering. Um, that's our STEM acronym that some people don't remember. Um, we propose to build PDX STEM online. This will be a portal for PSU students, secondary and university researchers, and STEM education um, researchers to collaborate in a manner that will transform teaching and learning um, in our region. Uh, PDX STEM Online, um, as it's designed, would have three interrelated functions. The first would be to create a student-centered uh, STEM personal learning environment. Um, the second would be to uh, uh, serve as a development platform for STEM courses and programs. And third would be as a research and development platform for uh, student measuring student achievement and uh, program improvement. Um, PDX STEM Online interface will feature a, an adaptive interface which will be customized to the user's needs and so the, each user would have the, both the ability to modify the site but it also would be a smart site in that it would be bringing content and opportunities to students um, according to their uh, pattern of use. Um, so let's think about how this would work for uh, a number of folks. So let's imagine Jane. Jane could be a student who's interested in pursuing a STEM career. Um, Jane, probably a very typical student on our campus, 26 years old, and um, um, Jane logs into PDX STEM online and she'll be able to manage her personal learning environment. Um, she'll be able to do this in a way that she can collaborate with online study groups, she'll be able to access tutors, she'll be able to meet content area specialists from STEM industries who can provide information on current topics and cutting edge research. Uh, we might also provide Jane an opportunity to, to uh, look at a research team, join a research team where she'd be introduced to projects that might give her um, uh, an insight into the entry of a, a STEM education career. Um, suppose we're looking um, at Jose now. Jose might be a chemistry teacher at a local high school, for instance, or he might be a member of the faculty in our university in the chemistry department. Um, so here's Jose's profile. As he goes to PDX STEM online, um, he's looking um, um, at five years of uh, he's been teaching. Um, uh, his teaching practice is probably a lot uh, like the one that he learned in, so his, his pedagogy of, of learning is very similar. 
Um, let's say that uh, uh, Jose learned from his colleagues that uh, changes are being implemented in the sequencing of chemistry concepts in a course. Uh, he may also have read that new instruction software is available to create online learning networks that, uh, um, that link students with uh, large classrooms to their cell phones and laptop computers. When Jose goes to PDX STEM online, um, he'll be able to participate in professional learning communities, um, the development of uh, increased effectiveness of his uh, teaching abilities. Um, so Jose will be able to align and collaborate with colleagues um, to bring into alignment his um, curriculum with the Math Common Core or maybe the Next Generation Science Standards or perhaps Oregon's College Readiness Standards. Um, Jose will be able to moderate student work samples. He'll be able to, to uh, uh, work with proficiency scoring rubrics and he'd be also invited to join uh, professional learning communities that support the implementation of new curriculum innovative uh, topics. Um, these community of practices that he'd be uh, participating in will help Jose to deprivatize his teaching and to encourage cross-campus inter-institutional and interdisciplinary collaborations. Um, finally, let's take a look at Howard. Um, Howard might be a, uh, uh, um, a department member in the, in the uh, Department of Physics or Department of Chemistry. Howard's been working with his colleagues to design and implement a mathematical uh, modeling program. Um, that provides students with real-world experiences in which they create, uh, in which they collect empirical data and look for algebraic patterns between measurable variables. Howard believes that his approach to increasing student engagement um, will particularly work well with Latino and Latina students who have been struggling in his class. So if Howard goes to PDX STEM online, he'll have access to um, a database of, of friends and colleagues who are uh, like-minded educators. Howard will also be able to scale up his research activities using common assessment measures that have been tried and, and, and tested for reliability and validity. Um, this community of researchers also will help um, Howard um, advance his practice and be able to comment and make uh, uh, suggestions on recent papers and webinar um, type formats. PDX STEM Online will be built using a collective impact partnership model. Um, in this model, um, partners agree to share an agenda, to aligned activities, to open communication, and to backbone organizations. The development of PDX STEM Online will engage more than 30 partners from the Portland Metro STEM Partnership, um, project planners and software engineers from the Center for Science Education, from um, Center for Online Learning, I'm sorry, um, Intel, Amazon, uh, Veneer Software and Technology, Learning.com, and Clarity Innovations. Um, PDX Online, as we envision it, is a gateway to the next generation of teaching and learning. Thank you.
So I, I just have to say something to all of you. So we're trying to get the site up, but in the meantime, we're going to be able to do a number of the presentations. It might take a little bit longer. But someone just tweeted that this was an 11 on the scale of 1 to 10 on the irony scale. <laughs> so, <laughs> so just kind of bear with us. And I know it's a little disconcerting um, for some of the presenters, but we'll get your stuff up and we'll get it going and um, in, the, in the meantime, talk amongst yourselves. I mean, I <laughs> so, so thanks. Okay. <laughs> Greetings, uh, colleagues. Uh, it's a great honor uh, to be invited to present today. Um, uh, I have two presentations, uh, both of which focus uh, closely on student success, student learning outcomes, um, the coin of the realm, as George described it earlier today. Um, so the genesis of this first project, the Language Integrated Knowledge Education Project, or LIKE project, uh, is focused on uh, something that began as simply a way to take the largest single department uh, on campus, World Languages and Literatures, and expand some of what we do from the minimum uh, requirement of two years for uh, BA students on campus to potentially have them take their foreign languages and leverage these forward by focusing on the development of language portfolios or like portfolios that allow them to apply to their focused discipline or professional interests the foreign language they were studying. However, as many projects do, this grew exponentially when I began talking with colleagues, particularly in STEM. As a, a, a life sciences uh, faculty member here uh, described to me, when I teach my introductory biology course, I make an initial statement. And this opening statement is, I am teaching you a language, the language of biology. And I certainly think this is highly relevant for first generation students that are just coming to university, for students that may not have academic discourse competence that will allow them to succeed both at university and in professional careers beyond. And this is something that I think we all intuitively know, right? That human knowledge is fundamentally mediated by specialized uses of language. And this is across all disciplines, from STEM to the social sciences, humanities, professional fields. As a, a learning sciences researcher, Anne Sfard, who focuses on mathematics education, mathematics education, describes it, thinking is a form of communication. Learning is modifying and extending one's discourse. Discourse and academic discourse competence are co-equivalent with conceptual development in many fundamental ways. And this includes uh, uh, you know, sign systems, uh, musical notation, um, uh, mathematics, uh, uh, chemistry, et cetera. Uh, language mediates many of these dynamics. So a question that we might begin with as we uh, start to frame what this might look like, like modules for all students in all disciplines at Portland State University, what terminology is specific to your field? What phrases, collocational patterns, words that like each other and glue together are recurrent, high impact, high frequency in textbooks, in lectures, in interaction with, uh, with lab mates uh, when you're uh, uh, carrying out uh, uh, a lab report activity, right? Um, and so it, it doesn't really matter if you're documenting computer code or architectural renderings or trying to present a business plan in a compelling way or are working on marketing strategies or are talking in office hours with a chemistry professor or a tutor. You need the language that is necessary for the conceptual development and the interactive engagement that is central to the learning process. We suggest then with this project that we take languages uh, or, or forms of language, forms of discourse that comprise many of the core fields on campus. Uh, here's an example uh, from an introductory textbook in calculus, an introductory uh, textbook uh, in ecology, architecture, sociology, chemistry, linguistics, of course, one of my favorites, continental philosophy, right? It doesn't matter what the discipline is. Language mediates your conceptual development and the ways in which you can fully participate in academic and discourse communities. So, uh, and this isn't just textual material. The, the initial uh, slides there, we're talking about textualities. 
Here are examples from a corpus of online, uh, an online corpus of academic spoken English with uh, what's uh, uh, um, uh, uh, discourse that occurs actually in classroom context. And you can see examples of uh, the use of the term matrix or the use of the term hypothesis, and these might be rather base examples for academics uh, uh, like you, uh, but for many students who are coming into university, being able to grapple with and execute successfully uh, academic discourse is pivotally important to their success. So what we're suggesting here is that mastery of academic discourse is essential to both university success but also beyond. Uh, explicit attention to the disciplinary genre conventions that enable full participation is precisely the kind of work that often goes ignored or at least is not explicitly discussed in the content courses uh, that we teach across the university. Language, in fact, is power, and the command of specific forms of language allow you to, to perform an identity that is relevant to your disciplinary and professional aspirations, right? All discourse conventions are reducible at some level, and forgive me for being a linguist here, to morphosyntactic realizations. These are things we can target explicitly, right? It's a lifelong skill to be able to do this, adapt, accommodate to new discourse communities, new professional standards and engagements, uh, uh, using language as a source for or a resource for doing that work. And here's the suggestion. Like portfolios, language integrated, knowledge education portfolios, largely uh, autonomous, uh, carried out by students. Um, uh, and the idea of these portfolios is uh, that they would draw and build upon the many excellent examples of e-portfolios currently available. Um, you can do this, and I would suggest every single university student at Portland State University do this in his or her native language. If it's English, wonderful, right? Um, but also perhaps do this in foreign languages. These could be stackable or repeatable as your language competencies improve. And of course, these could be open source so that eventually we come up with a plurilingual or multilingual set of linguistic resources that would allow us to do a better job of training people to perform the identity dispositions relevant to academic and professional success. We use language for all of these purposes. Okay? Um, and there are some details that you can read in the proposal about you know, how we get credit for this. Uh, we are typically, uh, uh, I think, uh, going to draw on some of the uh, uh, crowdsourcing uh, concepts, peer review concepts that are now widely used in MOOCs in terms of having students evaluate one another's uh, online uh, uh, like portfolios. And I believe this is critical to fostering student success both within the classroom at university, but also uh, pr it presents them with a lifelong learning ability to grapple with and uh, uh, incorporate new linguistic repertoires in their future domains uh, uh, wherever they might be uh, post-university. All right, um, presentation number one is complete. Uh, three minutes left total. And uh, the second one is called Virtual Internationalization Through Online Intercultural Exchange. Uh, Vivek Shandas and I um, are working on this. Uh, uh, this is, uh, again, a, 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 a project that began uh, with a thought for foreign or second language learning. Why not take uh, physically distributed communities, uh, uh, speakers of German uh, in Germany who wanted to learn English and speak uh, uh, students of German in the United States uh, who wanted to, uh, to learn that language better and put them into contact with each other, right? Um, and of course, when you think about virtual internationalization, in, Europe, in Europe it's called virtual mobility, um, uh, this is a concept that has really uh, come to the fore uh, and is increasingly uh, 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 doing so in a variety of ways. From uh, an educational context, looking at uh, uh, a shared poetry course um, in uh, Sweden and in the east coast of the US, uh, comparing and contrasting uh, films that were initially French but then remade uh, in the United States and having students on both sides of the Atlantic debate or, or, or go after this. STEM research uh, is huge and already distributed around the world. Many labs already have international partnerships uh, in process. So the idea here is a simple one, uh, interaction or collaboration with international but internet mediated partners. Any and all disciplines or subjects uh, would uh, benefit from this, I think. It's a very cost efficient form of intercultural engagement. Um, and uh, we believe that on, uh, 
being able to substantively engage in online intercultural interaction successfully, right, is a lot lifelong skill. It is exactly the kinds of skills you need to successfully compete or participate even in a mobile and rapidly glo globalizing world. The benefits are many. Students get direct experience. Just because it's internet mediated does not mean it's not direct. These are direct international experiences for students that could be component parts of courses, right? Uh, for educators, uh, faculty members, it opens up opportunities for international liaisons, new research projects, potentially uh, 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 cross-national uh, uh, grant funding uh, for different sorts of things. It could be part of pre-study abroad, for example. It could also serve uh, participants who may not have the physical mobility to, to engage in uh, uh, study abroad activity. And for, of course, universities, it's a low-cost internationalization strategy with many, many benefits. Um, uh, I'm currently a, an investigator on a large research project in Europe that is looking at exactly at this issue. We have eight partner camp campuses. Here's the, the website. Um, we have uh, uh, a number of approaches to doing this work. And I'll end with this slide. The ecological validity of this project is massive. What that means is, is what we're doing in instructed, university-based educational practices aligning with real world competencies, skills, and abilities. And engaging in internet mediated intercultural discourse successfully around content and in productive ways is I think seminal to success again in a, mo a mobile globalizing world. Thanks very much. Yes, yes. So folks, while uh, Eric is getting ready, I just want to say over 500 people logged on to the site, <laughs> which uh, brought the site down. And I don't know how to think about it, more or less along the lines that we need, at this stage, both belts and suspenders to do this work. So <laughs> I'll just sort of think about it that way. We have presentations. For the next two presentations, we have them in PowerPoint and Prezi. Those of you who are presenting after lunch, I'll encourage you to get PowerPoints, and if you're presenting tomorrow, I think the site will be working, but the lesson here is from where we are, we will probably need a backup plan moving forward. So thank you, everybody. All right, we're back up. Um, okay, so I'm Eric Bordegom in the Department of Physics, and um, I want to um, basically, everybody can read the slides, uh, so I will say something. Uh, uh, George mentioned cross-subsidy. And it's not only cross-subsidy uh, in, in, in universities, but it's also in individual departments. And the, um, here we show that you know, the number of degrees granted by physics departments in the United States is quite low, but the number of general physics courses taught, number of students is, is enormous. And so we actually did a survey at PSU in the, in the general physics, and people were interested in doing uh, online labs, distance learning labs. So, um, uh, you know, what a laboratory is good for. One is critical thinking. So our hope is that our students will get out of the lab and know how, to far, how far they can drive with their car before they have to get gas. Uh, so that's, that's, that's the hope. Now, uh, uh, there, there is, you know, American Association of Physics Teachers has a laboratory statement, and it's very important. Uh, and the NRC did a report on the labs and it shows that there's quite a few of um, uncertainty as to what people learn and what is the benefit of the labs. And so um, I think this is uh, opportune time to actually uh, 
go uh, forward with uh, a modified lab. And so um, the current lab's expensive, and then uh, there are some distance learning labs available, and just because in Texas people believe funky things, uh, in Oregon they believe funky things too. And uh, so Art Robinson, uh, he went against the Devasio. Anyway, he has a homeschooling kit and he uses the Bible as a main source of information. So he give, give you some idea about why people have, physicists have a look askance at distance learning lab. Anyway, now we have progress. Um, and I think um, we can now actually devise a, make a device that can do many of the things that previously cost about $10,000. So, and there's going to be a set available in, in, in the fall of uh, 2013, and we can be a, a test site. <coughs> so the uh, IO Labs is uh, developed by a, a physicist, and uh, why did he develop this? He had some curious experience. He actually developed the iClicker, and of course he had all the know-how to develop electronic circuitry and software and uh, he developed this IO Labs. And so um, we have teamed up with uh, community colleges, local community colleges, so local knowledge is being used to actually do the distance learning where they actually practice some of this already. Um, so uh, as I said, mentioned that this device is available uh, in the fall in a quantity of about 1,000 a, a uh, beta testers and uh, $60. It's going to be amazing. So, so what is the outlook? You know, we, we have the potential to be a leader here. Uh, I want to mention, I'm pretty proud of that, the American Association of Physics Teachers is the annual, the largest annual a conference was in Portland in 2010, uh, and it's again there in this year, and normally they don't repeat that often. So, uh, the, and the physics department, of course, is the host to the uh, APT. And then, of course, there is also local interest uh, in doing something along these lines, and uh, the veneers are definitely interested. So, so this is where I'm at. Thank you. Right, so last one before lunch, either a great spot or a horrible spot, we'll see how it goes. But a lot of people were involved in that, so I just want to take a moment. Um, as you know, doing things collectively across an entire unit uh, can be challenging. But all of the area directors in the School of Business, rather than department chairs, we have area directors, were involved in talking about this, our online people, our people in career centers, as well as university studies. So I just wanted to take a moment to throw that up there. And then, this is not news to people in the room, but really the motivation or what was inspiring us were really kind of key three things. MOOCs are coming, right? The big, bag, scary MOOCs. But also, we hear from our students so regularly that one of the things that they would love to be able to do is to get credit for the work that they do in terms of internships and their experiences. And we don't have a great way to do that right now. And also, the conversations continue about value added of degrees. So if I'm gonna be here for two to four years, or more, paying all this money, what is the value? How can you help me with that? So those were some of the things that grounded our conversation. 
So then that led us to really thinking about some of PSU's strengths. Again, you've heard some of these, these are echoed, but this went into the thinking. So one is really community-based learning. So when I came here 19 years ago, that was one of the big draws for me. Wow, Portland State is on the edge and doing exciting things. And I remember a Carnegie conversation um, early on there where someone came in and they said, you know, the world thinks you guys are doing great things and I know you're sitting here and you're, the technology isn't working or everything doesn't work all the time, but you're talking about it and you're talking about it 20 years before a lot of other people are talking about it. So I think that is a huge competitive advantage that we have and something that is really located in place. So that grounded what we were talking about, as well as I think Portland being a great location, right? I talk to students and they say, well, we could have gone and had our education in the middle of nowhere, or we could be in this vibrant, exciting place, Portland. And so while I think we're overexposed in terms of every time I turn on the TV or read a magazine article, I think Portland is still really an exciting and competitive advantage we have. And then we're rapidly expanding online learning capacities. The great thing about all this technology and how inexpensive and accessible it's become is we can really amass our learning, right? So many of us have been doing this for over a decade, and I think this is something that we, can, we need more work on, but we can catch up quickly. So it can definitely be a strength that we can leverage. So what was the problem that we were trying to address? Really here it was kind of credit for experience. So this, I've talked to some people around campus and I think it's a similar experience, but for sure in the School of Business, if you're a student and you get an internship at Google or Intel and you want to get credit for that, literally what you need to do is knock door to door or email faculty by faculty member until someone decides to donate their time to support you in that endeavor. Okay? So it's incredibly ad hoc when it's done. One student might have an amazing internship and they learn a lot, and another might learn nothing. Someone might just sign a piece of paper, someone might meet with them weekly, reflect, have journaling, and have a lot of learning take place. So we have apples and oranges. That's a concern. We also don't do a lot of them because of this, because it's one more thing on top of everything else. So last year in the School of Business, we have 2,800 students, 40 took internships for credit. So it's not something that we're doing well currently. Basically, I would say we're not doing it. And we limit it to internships. If you have a job at Intel or Google and you're coming to Portland State, we don't give you any credit for that life experience. And I'm not advocating, I don't think any of us are advocating that you should get, let's take three years off your four-year degree because of that. But you can't even document as part of your coursework and reflect in real time any credits because it's not considered what we do. All right. Imagine a different scenario. Imagine a scenario where you're working as an intern or full time. So in real time, while you're in that location, you have career building skills and exercises that you're doing in the moment. You get feedback on that. You reflect on that. And here's something that I think our students do amazingly well, but they don't know it. They don't understand the value of what they get here. So they aren't very good at articulating that and really thinking about what they're getting and what they've learned. So what are they learning in the classroom community base, in their capstone, in, in their internships, in their experience that they can actually articulate to employers and to each other and be more proud and excited? I'm always shocked at how few students actually realize what some of the goals and how they've been transformed are. So we'll skip those stats and go right to the solution. So we want to create a scalable mini MOOC for credit within Portland State that would be scalable from 20 students all the way up to the full 2,800 in the School of Business. We'd have the core material be around the top 10 National Association of College Employers skills and then customize people by majors. So put them in discussion groups by majors. And what's exciting about this is because it's modularized, it could work for any major across campus that was interested in getting on in, involved in that. And we can really talk about what does qualify as something that would be relevant and meaningful internship and work experience. So I believe that's my five minutes. Thank you. Okay, now we're going to do something that requires no technology. We're actually going to take a break for lunch. Um, and um, the lunches are available in the back of the room. Before you get up, let me give you the instructions. When you came into the ballroom, if you were registered for the symposium, you got a ticket that was a particular color. 
And you, if you have um, turkey, it's orange. Veggie is yellow. Chicken is green. Chicken Caesar is green, and roast beef is red. And um, there'll be people that are actually going to take your folks from our office. I shouldn't say people, individuals from our office who are going to take your tickets. What we will do is we will reconvene at 12:25, um, and then we will continue to do the presentations. And I want to just, you know, thank those presenters this morning who sort of struggled through our um, the technology issues and. Um, a couple people sort of said, you know, well, what do you mean 500 people bring down a website? There's 500 people logged into the um, Provost Challenge, not just viewing the website, but sort of signed in. And so we're working on that, and, and maybe by this afternoon we'll have it up and running again. But in the meantime, all of our presenters are prepared to present their things. So uh, we'll start at, um, get back at 1225. I mean, when I say back, you know, be ready to get going. Thanks. Thank you.